Present. Patty Cutray. Present. Thank you. Next we have the um, Pledge of Allegiance of I see Ms. Bolt, two leaders in the pledge. Thank you. We move to item 1D, adoption of the agenda. President Downey, um, I would like to pull item 7D from the consent agenda and uh, put it as the first action item. And if there's no other changes, I'd like to make that my motion. I'll second that. Lisa, we have a motion and a second. Patty Cotray. Aye. Anna Marie Knorr. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. And just for information, we'll probably slot that in after 8A. It seems as if it would be part of personnel. Uh, 7D is not part of personnel. It should be in Sorry, front of it. the action item. After. After. We'll have so to it'll, it'll out become where 7B. Make, we'll make it 8B. 8B. The new 8B. Okay. Okay. Next, we move to the superintendent's report. Dr. Lopeman. Thank you, President Downey. MUSD celebrated Read Across America Day. Guest readers visited throughout the district to encourage a love for reading. A special thank you to Mayor Nancy Smith, former Mayor Tony Smith, AKA the first gentleman of Maricopa, and Council Member Gettle for sharing their love for a good book with students at Saddleback Elementary School. And Butterfield Elementary had special visitors from Desert Sunrise Ed Rising, as well as the Maricopa High School swim and wrestling teams. The high school mentors read to students and demonstrated the importance of strong character, hard work, and giving back to their community. Pima Butte Elementary School recently hosted a literacy night featuring a vocabulary parade and celebrated their One School, One Book initiative. The book, A Boy Called Bat, has already captured the hearts of families and staff, and I can't wait to see how it ends. Spring has sprung, and Maricopa Elementary School preschoolers, preschoolers are planting flowers and beans. Students followed step-by-step -step directions, labeling their pots, adding soil and seeds, and watering to ensure their plants have a cozy place to grow big and strong. Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Elementary School students received extra tutoring and tender loving care over spring break in academic boot camp. The intercessions were designed to reinforce skills and build confidence to prepare students for everything in the fourth quarter. To infinity and beyond, Maricopa Wells Middle School blended 20 plus one students put their engineering skills to the test while cheering each other on at the annual rocket launch event. And we're gearing up for round two, which will take place Friday morning at Desert Wind Middle School. Thank you to Rose Law Group, Hilgery Wilson, Adam Leach Realty, Mayor Nancy Smith, and Council Member Bob Marsh for sponsoring the event, and to volunteers from the MHS JR OTC and Guy Smith, the rocket expert, for making it an unforgettable experience. Congratulations to Desert Sunrise and Maricopa High School Ed Rising students for placing top of the class at the Ed Rising State Competition. These future teachers competed against 36 Arizona high schools and will represent our state in the national competition this summer. Eager, empowered, and focused, these aspiring teachers are shaping the future of education. Maricopa High School culinary students Kaylee Segura Proventure and Savannah Quarles advanced to the final round of competition for the Careers Through Culinary Arts program, CCAP in other words, where they competed for multiple scholarship opportunities. The girls represented MHS with skill and creativity and are awaiting their results, which will be announced at an award ceremony in April. We wish them the best of luck. 
Maricopa High School continues to grow chorus, mixed choir, and Divisi, the Maricopa High School extracurricular a cappella group. MHS choral, choral students made history this year at competitive festivals, receiving the highest ranking of superior for their performances. An education rich in the arts, math, and science um, intersects, excuse me, an education rich in the arts intersects math, science, and language. It's where it all starts to make sense for our students, and it's, it's represented in social and cultural compositions that inspire a deep appreciation in the arts. Desert Sunrise High School filled their gym with positive affirmation, ways to de-stress, and, and those are furry four-legged friends in that picture, all in the name of mental wellness. Pause for teen mental wellness had students lining up during lunchtime to pet their new furry besties. Students left relaxed, smiling, and covered in pet glitter. And we call that fur <laughs> in my house. Maricopa High School Theater Company will present Shrek the Musical on March 30th and 31st and April excuse me, the 30th and 31st shows will be at 7 p.m. And on April 1st, that's Saturday, there will be a 2 p.m. and a 7 p.m. show. Come join the adventure as Shrek and Donkey embark on a comical journey finding unexpected friendships and surprising romance along the way. I am a believer. No bones about it, Maricopa High School sports medicine students are putting their knowledge of basic anatomy, skeletal, and musculo musculoskeletal systems to the test. Students practiced a variety of stabilizing wraps, including a thumb lock ROM resistance, closed basket weave, and ankle tape. You know, I really could have used that last week, and, um, <laughs> which leads me to my final update. I would like to recognize the outstanding work of the Boys and Girls Club for hosting the recent Dancing for Our Stars fundraiser. I was honored to participate. The passion and dedication every dancer gave in support of the Boys and Girls Club was absolutely remarkable. Every dancer truly put their hearts on stage, and this was so much fun, and through our partnership funds and through our partnership, funds raised in Maricopa will directly benefit MUSD students. My dance partner was none other than Heron Ildick, Aaron Hildick, MHS grad and ASU sophomore. Through her expertise and choreography, you're looking at the proud recipient of the Boys and Girls Second Annual Dancing for Our Stars uh, Showstopper Award. But the real win is a big win for our kids. And that's my report. Thank you, Dr. Lopeman. Now on to um, item 3A, um, board members report. Member Crochet. Oh, awesome. Uh -huh. um, as uh, Dr. Lohman shared, uh, we had our Dancing for Our Kids, and um, our preliminary figures are we've, we took in about $175,000 uh, for the event. It was a phenomenal event. And uh, soon we'll be putting, we'll be posting uh, the video so people can watch the video. Um, but we had over 500, um, 550 in attendance, 100 people online that paid for the pay-per-view to watch. Um, and voting took place um, before and during, and I think we even got some after. Um, it was a, it was just such a fun event, a huge event, and um, when you get a chance to watch the videos, uh, the intro video for all of our dancers, uh, you could just tell how passionate they were to serve in this capacity to bring awareness and to raise funds for the kids here um, in Maricopa and Casa Grande. Uh, so I was um, truly, truly blessed to be a part of it, and it was definitely a magical night. And I think I had like 30,000 steps on my pit. pit so um, other than that, which has really had been um, occupying most of my time since our last board meeting, um, I was able to attend a, a volleyball game, um, and I also helped out at the uh, MHS track invitational on the 18th, mm -hmm. where they had over 20, 20 schools attend. Um, I spent most of the time in the concession stand, but it was it was really a beautiful day for the event. So, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Member Anderson. 
point out of order here, President Downey. Yeah. Caught me off guard. I know. I like it means I have to pay attention. Yep. <laughs> well, welcome back from um, spring break. It's kind of weird to be back in full swing, and we've only got about six weeks left, and we're done for this year, which is like it's going to snowball and go as fast and just fast, fast, fast. So um, it's, I'm excited that the end of the year is here. We've made it. Um, it's been a successful year, I think. We've learned a lot along the way, and I am grateful to be serving um, on this board and representing parents and teachers and community members, so thank you. I also wanted to um, acknowledge and make you aware of tomorrow night here in the boardroom at, I think it's 6 o'clock, we're going to do a suicide prevention conversation with our partners, um, which is, I think it's a great um, it's going to be it's going to be a moving and a great conversation, but our partners Northern Lights Therapy um, is going to be conducting that and going to be answering questions and kind of giving us some data and some information. So, I think that um, anytime we can come out and learn something else, as we know, suicide is increasing in all of our communities, and I think I just hopefully want all of us to be aware of it and recognize the signs and kind of know the conversation to have with those people that may be struggling. Um, with their mental, uh, mental health. So that's tomorrow night, so hopefully I will see you here. It is open to community members, parents, students, so please come on out, and I look forward to seeing you. And then Saturday, um, I will be able to celebrate with our National Board certified teachers who have a recognition celebration Saturday night, so I'm excited to be able to celebrate their accomplishments because I know it is a tough uphill road for them to get those certifications, but I'm extremely proud of that program and the fact that we have so many national board certified teachers I think speaks volumes to our quality of our staff. So I'm excited to be able to celebrate that. And then lastly, April 4th is Arizona Gives. So I know that Against Abuse and the Boys and Girls Club are both um, state qualified um, nonprofits that you can go online at Arizona Gives and you can donate through their website, but the money goes right to those, those one of those two that you, that you um, specify. But the money is tax deductible, and so it's a great opportunity to see um, and help those that are less fortunate. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. And that's really all I've got. I feel like it's snowballing at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Member Noor. Thank you, President Downey. I was able to attend the Boys and Girls Club Dancing for Our Stars event this past Saturday, and it was an amazing event, and so pleased that we were able to raise so much for the Boys and Girls Clubs, because I know they've brought significant value here in Maricopa, and um, hopefully that will allow them to expand as well and serve all of our students. And I just have to say that our superintendent, Dr. Lopeman, has some moves. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she blew me away. So if you get a chance to watch that video, you should check her out because she can dance. <clears throat> right. And that's the truth. The Showstopper Award was appropriate. So uh, I was able to attend the Pima Butte Elementary fifth grade uh, awards today. My daughter was receiving an award, but it's always fun to attend those and see all of the students be recognized for their academic achievements. And my favorite award that they give at Pima Butte is the Motivated Mustang. And they give that to a student who may not have the A's and B's, but uh, really tries hard and does their best and shows good character. And I, I seriously almost like cry during that award every time I see it. So um, thank you, Principal Allison, for putting those together every quarter. I think they're very valuable. Um, looking forward to attending the Desert Wind Middle School co-ed soccer game tomorrow. Their season is starting, so that's going to be fun to watch, and the weather's beautiful, so I'm looking forward to that. And then I also wanted to add that Exceptional Community Hospital is going to be offering free AIA sports physicals for students who want to participate in athletics next year, and um, check the Facebook page for Exceptional, and that will be posted there. There's a link to a Sign Up Genius, and you can sign up for a specific time, and your student will receive a free physical so that they will be able to play sports in the 2023-24 school year, which is really important. I think that sports are an important part of school, and I know that sometimes getting the physicals can be an impediment for parents, 
And so we want to offer that um, free opportunity for students. So um, be on the lookout for that. That's all I have. Thank you. I don't have anything to report. I had family in for most of the time and uh, was on vacation for a while. So busy. OK. Now we move on to item four, call to the public. And we do have some cards, so I have to read this. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38431.01H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for a future agenda. The board requests that all comments be limited to three minutes or less, and that the public refrain from use of any speech or language that is offensive or inappropriate pursuant to the board policy KFA. Whenever you get up, just please state your name. You do not have to state your address, just your name. And I will um, call the people in the order. We have Bridget Woods. So she won't, even, won't be back in time? Okay. And next we have, is that Devin? Hi, my name is Devin. And Darla is my mom. I'm a second grader at Saddleback, and I had a bully call me name, threaten me, and it made me sad. He did it a lot. I told my mom and my teacher, Mr. G, Mr. G and the principal did something about it. And now the bullying from him stopped. Now, not all kids have teachers who help them, but mine did. I see my friends get bullied to my mom, to my mom and my nana always tell me to stay calm and tell a teacher right away. And that's what I did. I don't know why the he bullied me but it doesn't make me feel good. Please help my friends who are being bullied. Thank you for listening to my speech. Peace. Thank you, well done. Next we have Darla, is that Hitch? Hitch? No, I Darla. I am here again because we all know that the schools, have, the schools have problems with bullies. Bullies are everywhere. We can never stop the disrespect and the hate that a lot of people have. We can implement a more strict discipline action on campus. Discipline must be consistent throughout every school, no exceptions. Since the last meeting, I have put myself out there and spoke with many of our students of all grades from all of our schools. Some of our kids have been bullied for years by the same bully or bullies. Many have not even told teachers or their parents about it. When I ask them, what do they do to help themselves through this? Most of them said they do nothing. They deal with it. Some have resorted to self-harm and pretend to be sick. Some students even admitted to being at school but getting counted absent because they were hiding on the campus from their bully. This is not right. Our students should want to be at school, want to learn, want to make new friends, but instead they are scared, lonely, depressed, and only go to school because they have to. Their grades are suffering and many have admitted to asking for help, yet the bullying is still continuing. We must make our school safe for our children. If schools are not safe, our children are not safe. The most recent school shooting happened yesterday in Nashville, killed six people. He decided to take it out on innocent people. Kids are becoming depressed, self-harming, and attempting suicide way too much. We are allowing the bullies to take over our schools with no fear of repercussions. We cannot change their home life, but we can help them when they step onto our schools. If we have to step up, because of lack of parenting at home, then let's do it. Let's go to the state capitol, demand a change, modify laws, policies, whatever it takes. 
We must make our schools safe before we lose innocent staff and children. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Lisa Hitch. Hello, my name's Lisa. And I am a nurse. I work in behavioral health. I work with children as young as five, all the way up to the age of 17. And I don't know that a lot of people realize that just because a child, maybe the, the bullying stops, it doesn't stop in their mind. I have kids on my unit that have tried to commit suicide. They are self-harming. They, they actually threaten the schools and I don't, nothing really happens to them at the school level. And I don't know that they're, I know what you guys can do about it. I have no clue what can be done, but somebody needs to figure out something because this is a lifelong effect. I see adults, I work with everybody and mostly kids, but I do work with adults. I hear adults who are now have anxiety, depression, and they'll talk to me about it and you know sometimes it has to deal with the bullying just because they're out of school the bullying the effect of it does not stop for some people and they can have lifelong effects they're on medications they're in and out of hospitals and I, I don't even have an answer to you know how to help these people they put them on medication it helps some but the bullying we have to figure out a way to stop it and help these kids the mental health is what needs to be done. I don't know much about the, the policies and all that about discipline, but we have to figure out some way to help these kids. The bullier and the bully need help because we, we can't, like my daughter said, we can't change the home life. You're never gonna do that. We can't, we don't have any authority to do that. I deal with the parents, I deal with the kids, I deal with the adults. I don't know what to do either, but I do what I do with, because of the psychiatrist I work with and the other nurses. So I just hope that maybe there can be some kind of, I don't know, I don't even know, but something a group put together with psychologists and other people that work in the mental health field. And I know you're having that, that suicide thing, but I mean, that's a start, but it has to start with every age group. Don't think the kids are too young to, to commit suicide or try. Five-year-olds have done that, five-year-olds have injured teachers, five-year-olds have even fought with the police and took their guns and tried to you know, say that they're gonna kill themselves or them. So I'm just, I just don't even know what to do, but I just want you guys to be aware that it's never gonna stop. It doesn't stop with people just when they graduate. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Gallagher. Tara Gallagher. Last meeting, we heard lots of numbers, something to consider. Numbers lie. Numbers lie. Let me give you an example of how numbers lie. Tracy Pastor gave discipline numbers. Those numbers only show what's in synergy. But what if there was another way to record incidents, say, on a Google Doc? Welcome to Desert Wind's discipline tracking procedure. Your numbers aren't accurate because they aren't being reported correctly. This grossly skews them. It makes the problem seem smaller. I brought this up to Dr. Lopeman via email before she met with the schools about discipline, but never got a response. I have personally heard teachers bring this concern up to admin and still, this was not changed. Why do we need to lie? Because the problem is worse than we want it to appear? I was asked to not put students outside of my classroom because of how it would appear to district employees. Why didn't a middle school principal speak last meeting? Both Mr. Atkinson and I specifically talked about our concerns at this level. Was this to keep them from being asked questions that may show a less favorable result? I'm willing to bet the percentage of middle school students with more than one discipline issue is higher than the 16% Tracy shared. As a new hire in the district, there was no training at all on discipline policies. It is hard to get everyone on the same page within the district if it isn't even covered by the district. Speaking of the same page, our board members copied on emails sent to parents regarding safety, for example, when a lockdown happens. Do board members get regular updates on the number of discipline issues? Board, thank you for taking action to research the discipline policies. 
This is the first step in bettering our schools and therefore our community. Tom Beckett, thank you for finally doing something regarding additional personnel. I saw the postings for Dean of Students. However, there is still work to be done. Some suggestions. One, the students with chronic offenses could be put in a classroom together with an adult to supervise while they do assigned work from their teachers, thus keeping them from distracting the general population. When they've shown that they can manage themselves for a length of time, not a day or two, they may re-enter. This eliminates problems during passing periods and lunch as well. I brought this idea up to Ms. Balt while at Desert Wind. I would rather have spent my preps covering a class like this and being able to actually teach my other classes than covering classes anyway because teachers take mental health days or leave altogether. Two, the district should train and retrain all employees on the discipline policies and procedures explicitly detailing what behaviors fall under each. Three, share all safety emails with board members to ensure transparency. I left the district thinking I would be taking a $15,000 pay cut because no matter what Tom Beckett says, teachers value something more than money, safe working conditions. You can provide that by enforcing discipline. William Feather said, if we don't discipline ourselves, the world will do it for us. If you continue to fail in disciplining these students, you are forcing the world to do it in a, later in a much harsher way. Isn't it your job to prepare them for the future and the world they will answer to? Thank you. Thank you all that spoke tonight. Now I move on to item 5A, Spotlight School, Desert Winds Middle School. Ms. Bald. Good evening, President Downey, members of the board, and Dr. Lopeman. Thank you for having me here this evening to present about the work happening at Desert Wind Middle School. Tonight I want to present what we're doing with our iReady Reading and Math intervention program. Our implementation of iReady is aligned to the MUSD Strategic Goal 1, Strategy F. Every student graduates prepared to create, innovate, lead, and succeed by implementing a multi-tiered system of support. As a staff, we've been working diligently this year to align our collective vision, mission, and our core values in order to benefit all students. At Desert Wind, all means all. The work is never complete, it's always in process. This year, our staff has participated in professional development around building our campus into a community of care, centered on connection and engagement in the classroom, with an overarching vision that all students are achieving at or above grade level in both reading and math within two years. We are currently working as a staff to talk about our core values. So you see an example of where we are in that process with our vision and our mission. One of the core values that we've been talking a lot about is belonging. As we work to align all of these elements, our ultimate goal is to impact student success. This work supports our instructional vis vision and is based on our current data. So at the beginning of the year, this is just a timeline for you. We analyzed our school-wide data and we established a focus on growth. We worked together to implement iReady as a supplemental program to our core curriculum in order to impact student growth in reading and math. In July, students took a baseline assessment and their growth goals were established. Um, in January, students took their mid-year diagnostic in both reading and math. At the mid-year point, 58% of our students had already met or exceeded their growth goals in reading and 35% had met or exceeded their growth goals in math, which I think is pretty impressive. In May, students will take their third diagnostic, and at that point, growth will be measured. Our implementation is focused in two areas, individualized student remediation and enrichment based on the individual needs of that student, and supplemental remediation and enrichment in math and reading based on student data, teacher analysis, and the use of resources in the teacher toolbox. This also includes drill down data by standard. Twice a week, all students spend 30 minutes on reading and 30 minutes on math doing their My Path, which is the individualized portion of our iReady implementation. In the classroom setting, teachers have access to students' data and they have access to instructional supports such as groupings, Lexile level data, and lessons based on the core area content standards. 
I want to highlight some of the work that our teachers are doing using this data, beginning with our special education classrooms. In our self-contained setting, our students are visualizing their own growth and tracking their own data. So you see an example of how they're tracking the lessons using the fish, and then how they're tracking growth using the tree. These students received a special breakfast in January when they were the first group, the first classroom to complete the diagnostic. And we celebrated their progress. Um, we actually made breakfast burritos and it was quite a fun moment. In the resource setting, teachers are using built-in supports like text-to-speech and using data to develop small group instruction that's aligned to study sync. So we're using our study sync grade level curriculum in the resource setting and using iReady to scaffold and support the kids as they approach that grade level content. Campus wide, we're also focusing on using iReady to enrich the curriculum. For example, in our honors math setting, iReady is a tool used to enhance student mastery of skills. Additionally, there's a focus on students knowing and tracking their own progress and their own growth. In a, in a way to create ownership for our kids. In closing, I wanna take this time to thank the board and district leadership for providing the vision budget, which has allowed us to fund this project in order to increase student achievement. Through collaboration, we will continue to make instructional decisions that impact student growth until we've met the goals outlined in our vision. Any questions or comments? Quick comment, I, I know I asked for this report a while ago, so thank you. Um, I'm excited to see the cross-curricular and how it, it's gonna interact with the students, and so far it looks like you're really getting some great results. And I look forward to seeing your end of year data, maybe not at a board meeting, but at least sent to the board members, because I think it's got great potential for our students. So thank you for implementing that. Absolutely, thank you. I just want to ask a question. Has any of the other schools in the district came to you and asked for a walk through what you've done with iReady? Not yet. I know that both Desert Wind and MBA are using iReady, um, and we're using some other things at the 912 level um, in a similar capacity, but I would definitely be open to anybody coming to see what we're doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Now move on to item 5B, Desert Sunrise High School Ed Ready Program. Ms. Rednor? Oh, I am back. Yeah. Okay, um, good evening, President Downey and members of the board and Dr. Lohman. My name is Ali Krigbaum and I am the Ed Rising Advisor at Desert Sunrise High School. I have brought four of my amazing students tonight that will be sharing a lot about our program highlights and everything we did this year and I'm really excited about that. Ed Rising is part of the CTE umbrella at both Maricopa High School and Desert Sunrise High School. One of our goals that we set out for ourselves from almost the first day of school, well, we were like, we want to be a gold chapter. That was really, really important to us. So we have done things all year long to get ready for that. So we spent time at elementary schools. We were on committees at our school. We had to um, plan our winter formal. So we did a lot of activities. And one of the most amazing ones was speaking to you guys tonight. So that's why we are here tonight. So. I would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, this follows the MUSD strategic plan. Goal one, every student graduates prepared to create, innovate, lead, and succeed. Strategy C, provide multiple paths to graduation to meet the diverse needs of all students. And now I would like to um, present to you Daisy Aurora, who is our Ed Rising president. Educators Rising is a career and technical organization, also known as a CTSO, that is dedicated to ensuring that the future is full of high quality teachers starting in high school. It is also a part of the MUSD's uh, Grow Your Own initiative. And Ed Rising is a two-year program. However, at Desert Sunrise, it is a three-year program with, a, with additional courses. And I'm so excited to be able to have those additional courses because it's such a great opportunity. And I would like to now introduce to you Alexa Gomez Fuller who will be speaking about our highlights in our class this year. I would like to talk to you about the highlights we've had this class year. We just got back last week from our state competition in Tucson. 
Um, we just competed against ed other Ed Rising high schools, and all of us placed either in fourth place or above. We're now national qualifiers going to uh, to the Nationals in Orlando, Florida, later this year in the summer. In my event, I got first place, and I can't be more proud than all of us. This year, we were double trained by the reading specialist at Butterfield, as well as be we've begun the early stages of American Sign Language. We had participated in the Advising Fall Conference and networked with many other future educators. We attended an ASU workshop in January where we collaborated with professors and worked with them. I would now like to introduce to you Adriana Nunez. Um, one of our favorite activities this year was the cross-curricular project. We used, we have give, we were given the zoo animal theme and had to integrate core subjects such as math, reading, science, and more. My favorite part about this was doing an interactive notebook for first graders by interact, integrating the core subjects and identifying animals. At the end of the unit, we were able to go to the Phoenix Zoo and we had a lot of fun. Now I would like to present to you Malio Yoshikawa. Here we have some numbers for our advising class this year. We have 23 students enrolled in dual enrollment at CAC. We've accumulated 21 internship hours at both Butterfield and Santa Cruz Elementary School. We've had four guest speakers come into our class. Our class has helped 450 elementary students, all from Butterfield Elementary, Santa Cruz Elementary, and Desert Wind. And our class has gone on five field trips, one most recently where we just came back from the State Leadership Conference in Tucson. Here I would like to share with you some testimonies given by an Ed Rising parent and some Ed Rising students. Uh, Brittany Kniss said that she's noticed a positive improvement in her daughter's growth and she is more knowledgeable about approaching a career in education. One of my classmates, Serena, said that Ed Rising has helped foster her love for teaching and learning. And another one of my classmates mentioned that she's miles ahead of where she thought she'd be in her education career just starting out as a sophomore. It has been an honor to be in this class and we're so excited to see what year two will bring us next year. And do you have any comments or questions for us? I don't have any questions, but thank you for being here. That was a phenomenal presentation and I can't wait for you to be teachers in MUSD. Thank you so much. Just thank you. I know I've had the opportunity to come into your class, and it was always, I, I always love spending time with students. But I have to say, I love, love, love this program. And it's, I've been an advocate for this long before we started it. So um, I'm encouraged by the fact that we have students who want to be educators. Um, it's, it's a passion, and I see that in your eyes. And thank you for taking this journey and taking us with you. So I appreciate that. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, underline what what's my, uh, Member Noor and Member Anderson said. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> okay, we now move on to item 5C. MUSD Central Arizona Valley, Inst Valley of Institute. Institute of Technology CAVIT program. And this time it is Mrs. Fenor. <laughs> Good evening, President Downey, governing board members, and Dr. Lobman. It's kind of rough to follow that, but good news is we have more students, so stay, stay tuned. We are excited to share with you information about Central Arizona Valley Institute of Technology, commonly called CAVIT, which Maricopa Unified uh, School District partners with to extend career opportunities, opportunities for our upper level students. At this time, I'm going to introduce you again to Dr. Emily Maxwell to highlight this work as well as some, some of our students who participate in this program. Good evening. Our presentation aligns with goal one, that every student has, has access to an equity and excellent educational services, resources, and programs. In strategy C, as we are providing multiple paths to graduation to meet the diverse needs of all students. I want to start by saying that CTE has so many acronyms. You've heard a bunch of them tonight. Mm -hmm. 
We have CTSOs, which you just heard from, that are embedded in our CTE programs. They help build industry and leadership skills. On the other hand, CAVIT is our Career Technical Education District, or CTED. CTEDs offer us financial support. They help us with monitoring of CTE programs. They offer specialized programs on their campus. And those programs increase dual enrollment opportunities and are based off of the industry needs and job demands in the area. The partnership with CAP CAVIT helps to offer specialized programs that are not ideal for a high school campus. Each year, we have about 85 to 100 students enrolled in CAVIT. This year, CAVIT's total enrollment was about 770 students. And we are excited to see that number grow as the programs continue to gain excitement. CTE programs require additional funding because of specialized equipment, certifications, and supplies. CTE provides us with a considerable sum of money which is dependent on enrollment in CTE programs at Maricopa High School and Desert Sunrise High School. This money is used to ensure our programs are up to industry standards. With CAVIT dollars, we have purchased an, an, an industrial oven for culinary, 3D printers for engineering at both schools, a point of sale system for DECA Cafe, as you can see in the bottom picture. Another part of CTU programs are certifications. CAVIT money is used for certifications and study materials and programs such as CDX for auto and KP Compass for culinary. It also pays for registration and travel costs associated with the CTSOs, such as SkillsUSA and DECA. Last year, it paid for more than 10 students to travel out of state to national competitions. The top picture is of Brad Chamberlain's computer maintenance class at this competition. CAVIT funding is not based on those who attend CAVIT, but connected to CTE enrollment at Maricopa High School and Desert Sunrise. As you can see, the amount of money given to us over last year has increased, and that has become, as that was because of our increased enrollment in both high schools. Students are excited to be in CTE and part of the CAVIT program. CAVIT offers amazing opportunities, and with that excitement for programs, this year, CAVIT is at capacity. They had a lottery system to choose the students that would be in their program. Students can apply when they are a junior or a senior. They must have a 2.0 GPA and must be on track to graduate. If accepted into CAVIT, the students have an additional time commitment. MUSD transportation graciously provides transportation to all students every day that CAVIT is in session. AM CAVIT students leave at 5.50. That's really early. And PM CAVIT has a zero hour class that begins at 6.30 and they return to campus at 3.30. With the MUSD commitment and CAVIT partnership, all students have access to CAVIT's amazing program. Now, to highlight the law enforcement programs, I would like to introduce Layla Smith. Good evening. <clears throat> Being in this CAVIT program has brought me opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten with just regular electives at MHS. Of being in this law enforcement program, I have been trained to handle law, oh, I'm so sorry, handle situations similar to what law enforcement officers handle and encounter on a daily basis. In these situations, we encounter high rooms, high risk room clearings, high risk traffic stops, kidnappings, and crime scene investigations. In my two year experience, I have received certifications that will demonstrate real world and practical skills to future employers. Certifications to include CPR, OSHA, and tourniquet certification. Tourniquet certification was an intense four-hour course where we learned how to apply life-saving first aid devices to both officers and citizens. Being a member of CAVIT has also allowed me to be a part of the Skills USA board. It has offered me the unique opportunity to develop and deploy leadership and responsibility skill sets. I've served as treasurer for our class student body learning to responsibly manage and distribute funds. 
It has also allowed me to establish a leadership role by mentoring new students joining our class. Next up is Cameron Bear. Good evening, I'm here to talk about some of the unique uh, opportunities that Cabot offers for students trying to gain an advance in their career while still in high school. So as a seat said school, we have access to academic organizations such as the National Technical Honor Society. The NCAHS has unique scholarship opportunities for its members that ordinary students cannot get and Cabot students have access to those should they meet the grade requirement for them. We also have merit-based competitions such as HOSA for the medical students and Skills USA for the more technical side, so those are like the law enforcement, the fire science programs, the drone science ones. There's a bunch of others. I don't remember the exact names of right now. But the, those competitions, they're great because they give you on-hands experience with issues you will face in your actual career path, as well as they're all graded by professionals in the industry. So you can get hands-on uh, feedback from people in the, in the field right now that you can learn from. And what that's also great for is Cavit is great for building a network. We have guest speakers all the time in each unique program. I've hit, we've had at least 20 in our program, the law enforcement one alone this year, and the other programs have all had theirs as well. So we're able to build contacts in the field that will help us give advice, help us get jobs sooner than other normal students will get because we're able to take advantage of you know, having this network. We can do ride-alongs with them. We can help them sit in on their jobs, which is something that normal civilians or the public students could not just normally do but we, we are able to because of the opportunity we have with this school. And I think that's really unique. I'm gonna give the mic back to Dr. Maxwell to finish up for us. Any questions? I, I have a couple. So I, going back to the beginning, you were talking about 700 students on, are enrolled. Are those 700 MUSD students or 700 over the county? 700 over the five, was it five different school? Yes, 700 in 70 over the five different school districts that are a part of Cabot. So it's just Cabot, okay. Yeah. So I was just curious as to, and how many were from MUSD? How many do we have? We have around 85 to 100. Okay. And do we do any, um, because I know we hear a lot about EVIT and how wonderful it is, and a lot of our parents send their students to EVIT, send their children to EVIT. H how actively are we advertising in the media and print and just so that community members understand that we have these programs? So how actively are we uh, advertising for Cabot in the community? Yes. Um, we have not, I know we actively advertise for Cavit within the school and within our parents at the school, um, but we have not um, reached out to the community at this point, but uh, that is a great idea that we can definitely begin to as we, yeah. as we are growing and as we are seeing um, the need for it. I, it, is, it is something that we can definitely look into expanding the advertisement of that. Absolutely. Cool. No, absolutely. I think it's fantastic. I know both of my sons went to a couple of different CTE and Cabot programs, but I, um, they're great life skills. So I'm glad we provide this opportunity for our high school students. And I just don't know that our community realizes that we provide this because I think it's incredible um, part of the public school system. And so it's not like it's an extra cost, um, which I think parents parents and community members need to know about. So I look forward to hopefully expanding this and seeing some ads in the newspaper. Absolutely. Dr. Lopeman. Yep. We'll begin working on that. <laughs> we consider you. it one of our signature programs. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever we publicize uh, any of them, we talk about CTE and all and the associated programs with Cavett. We've taken that off of, Ms. of Dr. Maxwell's plate. So we will, we've got all your suggestions and we'll take it from here. Awesome, thank you. Dr. Maxwell. Very, very nice presentation. You guys did great, thank you. Um, you said that right now they're at capacity. How many MUSD students have not been able to participate that wanted to participate? I don't know of that exact number um, because I wasn't aware of the, of the students. I know the number who were accepted, but I'm not aware of the number who were not accepted. Um, we have about the same number. It's about 85 to 100. And then we also have, I believe it's about 50 
that are enrolled at Desert Sunrise High School. So sure. total between both high schools, we're now at about 150 total. Okay. And have you seen out of that list of the, of the 13 programs, um, do we have a tendency to gravitate to a few of them or do we have students involved in every one of them? We have students involved in just about every program. I know the most popular ones are cosmetology and um, the, the nursing field um, are usually the most popular ones. So, Fantastic. I'm really excited. I hope for, that we don't have to turn any of our students away um, in the coming years because I think that would be be horrible to have to do that. Is there any other programs that we're considering that Cavett offers implementing into any of our MUSD schools? They wouldn't have it as part of our MUSD um, schools like on our campus. Um, they, they are looking to expand the programs that they have currently at their site because they are building an additional building. Okay. Um, so they're looking at doing construction and HVAC and starting to get into the construction field at that point. Awesome. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you for being here tonight and thank you to the students who presented and shared their knowledge and keep up the great work. Thank you. Uh, no, I've got some comments and, and maybe a question for <laughs> Leland and Cameron. So it sounds like the Cavett students can graduate with industrial recognized uh, certifications. Obviously that puts them in a position where they can go directly into the workforce or actually just pursue their career path, that career path further with um, a significant heads up on others. Um, and no, Lee, Lee and Cameron, if they were actually to go, they're not ready, they're not ready to be police, so don't arrest us tonight. But I know if they were to go into the police force again, they would probably go in at a higher level than most recruits into that, into any of the areas that we cover, but a specific in terms of the police force. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you obviously did, you spoke about doing drills and scenarios, real life drills and scenarios. Do you have one that went significantly wrong and ended up like in laughter? Because um, we learned by our, by some of my biggest yeah. learnings or some of my biggest mistakes. Yeah, so um, just yesterday actually, we were doing a high risk traffic stop where we were trying to clear a vehicle and uh, one of our classmates uh, did not properly like clear a trunk so they weren't following sa proper safety protocol. And we, we have airsoft guns in our uh, law enforcement class for training. So she opened that the wrong way and there was somebody hiding in the trunk and she just, she just got kind of blasted. <laughs> and then uh, real quick, just to, I don't remember exactly who was uh, asking about uh, if we do advertising for like other schools. Um, we, we, can, we compete with other schools in those competitions like EBIT as you mentioned. So we advertise to the audiences that are there to attract people to, to come to our schools and Cavett usually outperforms EBIT in most of these events even though EBIT hosts them. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Exactly. Yeah. Leah, do you have any examples of real life drills that uh, went wrong, went funny? So as Cameron had mentioned, we do have airsoft guns that we use. Um, so when we were doing our high risk clear building searches, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times uh, students don't holster their gun. So they will be walking around with it. Um, but when we did these, we had the lights off. So people were just walking around shooting and then they started shooting other people. But I mean, I guess that would be the point of it. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we take precautions, so. I think we're pretty safe with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, when I move on to item 5D, MUS Signature Programs Update. Ms. Renor. I have different friends joining me for this one. So good evening again. It is a privilege to share with you highlights and updates of our signature programs here in Maricopa Unified School District. This aligns to goal one, every student graduates prepared to create, innovate, lead, and succeed, specifically strategy C, to provide multiple paths to graduation and meet the diverse needs of our students. Last year, I shared two signature programs with you, the first one being the dual language immersion program at Santa Rosa Elementary School, and the second one being the accelerated program at Saddleback Elementary School. The accelerated program was launched this year with 20 kindergarten students.
They will matriculate to first grade next year as we continue to build these offerings. The dual language immersion program at Santa Rosa Elementary School began last year with our preschool and kindergarten students and it continues to grow as we added first grade this year and next year we'll be adding second grade. Both of these programs continue to grow and our students thrive who are enrolled in them. As we plan for next year, we are expanding our signature program opportunities for families in MUSD. First, Janelle Heldick is going to share the work that she is leading at Butterfield uh, as Butterfield Elementary School is in the process of becoming an official STEAM school. So good evening, um, President Downey, governing board members, Dr. Lotman. Um, so Butterfield has created a vision to formalize our school's STEAM um, program, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Our team of students, teachers, and parents are enthusiastic about the work, which involves several components crucial to its success, sorry about that, um, moving forward. So our STEAM implementation requires a cross-curricular approach to teaching that incorporates all content areas, even including social studies, even though it's not in that acronym, but we do include it too. <laughs> um, this school year, we provided teachers professional development on the gold standard of project-based learning. Our teacher teams then worked together with our school's um, vision budget funded STEAM specialist to design the cross-curricular um, projects aligned to our district curriculum and our state standards. In addition to this, we are increasing the rigor of our practices to provide the best possible learner outcomes by becoming candidates this year for Cognia accreditation and applying for STEM certification. Through this intensive accreditation and certification process, we will be able to further increase the rigor of our STEAM program. Cognia provides us with professional development, training, and feedback. So for next school year, with the use um, of part of our vision budget, we are sending our STEAM team, which is, that's what we call it, our STEAM team, um, back to the annual PBL World workshop to connect with educators from around the world. This will provide teachers and administrators more intensive training to increase rigor and provide coaching. We will plan four quarterly projects and implement STEAM project boards in the classrooms. We will plan to get uh, Cognia accreditation and go through the review for the STEM certification through Cognia. Finally, we will implement TechSmart coding in third grade and add a grade level each year until um, for the subsequent two years. So we'll add we'll have third, fourth, and then fifth grade. Our goal is to be Cognia accredited and STEAM certified for the 24-25 school year and streamline our implementation moving forward by having a fully functioning innovation center for our students and teachers in the 27-28 school year. Um, and on next, So what are the benefits of STEAM education? So when we look at STEAM um, and how it's implemented, as a, it should be implemented as an interdisciplinary approach, impacting outcomes across multiple content areas and increasing academic achievement and cognitive functioning in children. It's important to, be, to build these STEAM skill, skills at an early age, so in pre-K, kindergarten, to help set that strong foundation to help students more effectively collaborate, regulate emotions, and engage in tasks and projects. Research has shown that students learn best with experiences that promote autonomy, curiosity, and inquiry through project-based and student-centered learning. Continually providing a high-quality professional development and coaching support can help teachers become more comfortable with STEAM education and at the same time provide uh, a strong foundation for potentially rapid acceleration, especially post-pandemic, seeing a lot of that. So at this time, I would like to turn the mic over to Principal Reinhardt, uh, who will be sharing her program at Santa Cruz Elementary. Good evening. 
I am excited to introduce Fine Arts as the signature program for Santa Cruz Elementary School. We've been planning most of this year and we're looking forward to the expansion of the arts at Santa Cruz. Some of the benefits of a fine arts program include students buying into their learning and becoming active participants when the learning, with the arts are intentionally integrated into their lessons. Students engage in critical thinking and construct personal meaning through arts integrated lessons. They develop problem solving skills and the ability to innovate. This builds grit and perseverance. Our teachers become facilitators of creative learning and are empowered in their professional growth. Educators feel fulfilled when they are able to provide a hands-on learning environment for students. Fine Arts yields an equitable learning environment for all students by providing multiple access points to learning. And it provides a research-based pathway to teaching 21st century learning skills with natural avenues for differentiation. This year, we started dabbling a bit more with our current fine arts classes. Our fourth and fifth graders are really enjoying their new experiences with ukuleles and pottery. Next year, we plan to expand our fine arts classes and add quarterly projects and quarterly showcases. As you can see, we will be adding two grade levels progressively each year. We have three main focuses, art as curriculum, this is expanded specials offerings. Students will have PE, music, and art as the other elementary schools do, but we will add dance, drama, and another fine arts. Art as enhanced curriculum. Each quarter, our grade levels will focus on one project tying in a fine art with the standard curriculum, such as dance with social studies or art or music with science. Finally, arts integrated curriculum where art becomes embedded in the general education curriculum. Students are learning art standards at the same time they are learning academic standards. All units would have some form of art integration. And this concludes our presentation. At this time, we'd like to open up for any questions or comments you may have. Okay, I'll just make a comment about, um, you know, I got to recognize with Dr. Lopeman and the team behind her, plus the previous board, who actually came up with these vision budgets and the concept of vision budgets. And I have to say, in the first couple of months, I think they weren't used the best. But this year, I think we're seeing the benefit of that, that the, the budget's going there. And I just want to recognize it takes more of that than just money. It takes people with the vision. It takes people that are prepared to plan, prepared to work, and leadership to implement them and implement them well and be successful. So I want to recognize you and people that have spoken tonight, but also others that have spoken in previous meetings about taking those vision budgets and actually doing something that's benefiting our students, really going directly to our students and not just normally even in your own school. Some of these have, as you say, uh, I think it was previously said, long term through elementary, middle, high school and actually into life skills that will help the students for the rest of their lives. So I just want to recognize that and thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we now move on to item 6A, work study, student discipline, and campus safety. Dr. Lopeman. Thank you, President Downey. Um, as you know, we've committed to regular board meeting updates regarding um, information, training, policy analysis, and so forth. And um, I was worried, as was Ms. Pastor, that we wouldn't have enough to report with such freak, at such a frequent interval. Um, but that's not the case. So Ms. Pastor is here to um, update the board and the community on the progress. Good evening. President Downey, Dr. Lopeman, board members. I'm here this evening with an update, as Dr. Lopeman shared, um, that will include reviews that we've done with administration, um, a brief policy review, audits that have been conducted, and I'll also share the results of our initial meeting of the uh, Student Discipline and Campus Safety Task Force. Everything we do 
that falls under discipline and safety aligns with goal one. Every student graduates prepared to create, innovate, lead, and succeed. And our strategy is to create safe and orderly environments where every student can learn and every teacher can teach. I meet regularly with the AP TOSA Dean Group. And in our most recent meeting, um, upon returning from spring break, we reviewed some sample discipline referrals. Using the student handbook and governing board policies, we reviewed definitions for infractions and the code of conduct and range of consequences for infractions. We also reviewed types of incidents that must be entered in Synergy, our student information system, and the data that must be included with each referral, such as time, location, perceived motivation, and much more. All discipline referrals that result in a suspension are sent to me on a daily basis. That's been the practice for quite some time. Those are reviewed, and then an audit comparing these paper referrals to synergy entries happens on a weekly basis as well. This information that was reviewed was also reviewed with principals this week in the principal meeting. So I'd like to review briefly um, this slide from our uh, last board meeting. So this was a list that I had made of all uh, governing board policies that um, touch upon some aspect of discipline. And those that are highlighted in yellow were touched upon briefly um, last month. And then what we have in that teal color is a policy review that I'd like us to, to take a look at this evening, student conduct on school buses. So when you pull up policy JICC, student conduct on buses, it refers you to policy in section E of support services, specifically policy EEAEC, that's a, a mouthful, which has the same title, student conduct on buses. Um, I'm not going to read the policy, but I do want to highlight one part of it, which is that students who have serious disciplinary problems may have their riding privileges suspended. I also um, want to highlight that expectations of conduct on buses are outlined in our student handbook. And recently, I met with our director of transportation to discuss this topic. And it was also covered in that recent meeting with our AP TOSAs and deans. I've also begun a series of meetings at schools with principals to discuss systems for students with multiple discipline incidents. Prior to each meeting, principals are reviewing the data of these students, including the total number of days of suspension, the types of infractions, whether or not the student has an IEP or a 504, if the family has acknowledged the student handbook, if the student is receiving counseling, PBIS support, if the student is being discussed in multi-tiered systems of support for behavior meetings, and additional systems to provide support for teachers are discussed, such as assigning someone other than the classroom teacher to be a mentor or a check-in, check-out, a trusted adult for that student. We're also discussing with principals systems of support for parents of these students, uh, such as regular communication, including the good news phone call. I'd also like to highlight um, an audit the trust works with um, many districts, and um, our MUSD is one. And they provide a free service, and we took advantage of that during spring break. It is, a, is an in-person safety and security audit. And so um, we walked two of those schools with principals of Desert Sunrise and Maricopa Wells. The feedback was constructive, and, and they applauded us for investing resources and taking measures to ensure the safety for employees and, and students. They have a comprehensive questionnaire that was shared with all principals, as this is an excellent tool for them to use with their school safety and prevention team. Um, I'm um, conducting a supervision audit. Principals were asked to send in all duty schedules uh, so that we could take a look at the average student-teacher ratios for each school in their different areas of supervision. Principals will continue to review this data to ensure that they've prepared for every scenario, from rainy days to those days when we have too many staff out sick. A good example of how a principal uses this data 
is uh, when recently an elementary principal shared that after seeing a, an increase of referrals during lunchtime, they saw the need to increase supervision in the cafeteria, and then after making that change, they tracked and saw a reduction in referrals during that time. So now let's talk about um, the Student Discipline and Campus Safety Task Force. So the first meeting was held on Thursday, March uh, 23rd. Uh, total attendance at the first meeting was 68 members. It included all of cabinet, all principals, AP TOSA deans, parents, students, teachers, and classified staff. All members were surveyed in advance about the issues and concerns that were most important to them. And from there, based on that information, we divided into four subcommittees and we heard from members in each group. The feedback I've received from staff and parents thus far is positive about this first standing room only meeting. And moving forward, we want to ensure that voices are heard while contributing to meaningful discussions that will lead to improvements in systems and overall student and staff safety. We, will, we have our second meeting next week and we'll be working towards a SMART goal for each subcommittee and recommended action steps for each subcommittee. I look forward to sharing the meaningful work with uh, you all when we conclude our meetings this year. If the board is interested, I'd love to have a follow-up work study where you hear an update directly from some members of the task force. And from there, I open it up to discussion, questions, feedback. I just want to say I think that's a great turnout and that's wonderful that so many people are involved in this and that will help us to continue to improve. So I know that we're in the beginning stages um, and I'm grateful that we're doing this. My concern is it's not going fast enough. I think that's probably everybody's concern. I know that it takes time to change some of these systems that are that have been archaic maybe, or not equally implement, implemented at each campus. Um, as I'm looking through the policies, our policies are good. Our policies have um, behaviors and ex expectations for what we want in each one of our classrooms. So I, I'm hoping that the task force will come up with a way that we can implement the systems to support the policy in an equal way across campuses so that um, we get a control over the situations that are happening. And, and I know that every principal has their own community within their campus and I respect that, but I'm looking forward to seeing policies implemented mm -hmm. and enforced and the system strengthened. So, one of my questions is, is what do I need to do as a board member to help provide that support that principals need? Um, because obviously we could always use more staff, but that comes with budget. Um, but I just, I'm curious as to how can I help as a board member? How can I help support those systems and get principals and parents um, what they need to be safe on campus? Because that really is a priority for all of our campuses. So I'm just, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the reports and seeing what the task force has come up with. Um, another question I have is which schools have ISS classrooms? Um, ISS is primarily a secondary function for the most part. So do all of our secondary schools have an ISS classroom with a, with a teacher? Yes, I'd have to consult with okay. Mr. Beck to make sure we don't have any vacancies that I'm not aware of right okay. now, but yeah. So campuses do, and at the elementary level, because I know middle school and high school, so elementary level, do we see a need for some ISS classrooms there, especially in our fourth and fifth graders? I guess that's... So I'll interject there. Yes, we um, A few years ago, we added the behavior person and gave that to principals, and that actually came in response to some conversations that I was having with teachers, just like this. So I think it was probably four years ago that we proposed that position, and it was a full, it's a full-time position, and that was the 
the idea was to give this person to principals and yes, they could use that person as an ISS monitor, supervisor, or on days that there were no I students in ISS because it's not it may not be a daily thing at elementary. They could do other things in support of behavior, whether that's PBIS or, you know, uh, I don't know. So any other way that they needed to use the that position to support behavior. Okay, I mean, I, I like I say, I just feel like sometimes we're not doing enough. Um, and so I, I look forward to hearing what the task force has to report to us because I think we can do more as a board. I have a couple questions. Um, first off, this is great information and I think it's a great start. Um, you said that we had uh, the trust come and do uh, visits at uh, Desert Sunrise and Maricopa Wells. Are they planning on doing audits, safety audits of all of our schools? So this, the questionnaire, the tool that they provided and, and the fact that we had uh, facilities and two principals and myself spend the day with them, we're able to um, replicate at a smaller scale and one of the, at the other schools without um, the trust being a part of it. And one of the things that they pointed out is that many times as we walked through those two schools, some of the suggestions uh, applied across the districts as we looked at things that we needed to pay more attention to. Well, and I know that we have done safety audits. We've walked the walk to make sure everything, I know we've done that before, but I understand that you have these tools now, but are we scheduling, because each school may be set up a little bit differently. So are we scheduling that then to be done from now until the end of the school year with our other school sites to address anything that might be glaring when we do this? Yes, we have a list of additional <laughs> follow-up that we're doing, especially with the areas that they pointed out as as a recommendation. Okay, and, um, and you, I noticed you said you, we had a bunch of subgroups. Mm -hmm. um, could we get a list of what those subgroups are so that we kind of know what you guys are, the, the task? So um, my subcommittee that I lead, um, we ended up calling it fidelity. I think it has to do um, with a lot of what Ms. Anderson just spoke about, consistency in how we're looking at our data, how we're inputting it, how we're looking at consequences. So that's the group that I lead. And then we have one that is looking at prevention that um, touches upon our counseling services. It touches upon bullying prevention. Um, we have that group. We have a parent engagement group. There was a lot of um, interest in a parent engagement group. And then lastly, we have a group that is looking at PBIS, our PBIS systems, and restorative practices. So those are our four groups. Thank you so much. This situation didn't happen overnight, and it's not going to be fixed overnight. But I'm glad that we're making the efforts to address this. Yeah, I, I just want to comment on, to build on Member Couture's conversation on the trust. I mean, I just want, it wasn't something that was in my mind, but it's actually a great thing to do. But it's also, to, and you need to be brave to do it because you've got these experts that are coming in to audit your district. And yes, you will get a lot of feedback, but that feedback probably is going to contain a lot of criticism. And they might give you some you know, well dones and whatnot. And so just, um, I just think it, is a, it was great to do. Uh, just want to recognize that and all the other work that's going on that the other members um, recognize. And uh, like Member Anderson, we all want it resolved tomorrow. Um, I think she's right in the like, at some point soon we went, may need to set a, our goal is, yeah. I don't know, by the new school year, a lot of this will be implemented. We'll have these changes in place. Uh, certainly as the new teachers come in and whatnot, we educate them across the district. Mm -hmm. So we're adopting in one standard, one best practice. But well done so far. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're now moving on to the consent agenda, M7. I motion that we approve the consent agenda, which is item 7A through C. I'll second. Lisa, we have a motion and a second. 
Patty Coutre. Aye. Anna Marie Noir. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. We now move on to item eight, action items, specifically item 8A, discussion and possible approval of the personnel schedule. Mr. Bankett. Thank you, President Downey, members of the governing board, and Dr. Loebman. Uh, I think that's obvious that we've been busy uh, <laughs> since uh, five weeks ago. Uh, we've been uh, uh, seeing a, a, a good, good effort from not only my staff, but also from our, our principals in particular that are, that are really hustling to try to get these openings taken care of. I'll take any of your questions at this point of time, though. Well, I have a couple of questions, but before um, I ask the questions, I do want to um, be very transparent, as everybody can tell, number 62 is related to me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I just wanted to reassure everybody that uh, it is not a violation of the policy. Um, she is not a dependent of mine and has not been a dependent of mine since she graduated uh, Maricopa High School. She's been on her own, um, and she does not plan on coming back home. Uh, so, except maybe for maybe an occasional dinner on the way home from work. Uh, but we're excited to have her, um, that she chose back to come back to MUSD. Um, she's worked very hard the last four years, and I couldn't be very more proud of her uh, graduating from ASU May 9th uh, with no debt. So, um, but I needed to state that so that I wanted to be totally transparent that everybody knew that it was not a violation of policy. Um, the other questions I have, Mr. Beckett. <laughs> um, yeah. Items number 90, 91, and 92, those are stipend requests for stipends that we do not have on our stipend schedule. And I do apologize. I know that I sent these questions in late, and I apologize, but I was a little busy with an event over the weekend. So. <laughs> um, but uh, they're not currently on our stipend schedule. And I don't have a problem with stipends or giving stipends to our, our employees, without a doubt. But I do want to make sure that we follow the protocols and the procedures and that they are added in a, in a manner prior to us approving them on the HR schedule. Um, so I, I would like those to be removed and added before we add the money. I, I want to see us to follow the proper procedures when we make an adjustment to our stipend schedule because it's, it's board approved and it's not currently on there. And then item number 94 is for next school year. Um, when we were approached a couple meetings ago with the staffing um, I know Mrs. Anderson specifically asked about the stipend schedule, if there was going to be any changes. And at that time, there wasn't. Um, and now there is. So I would like to pull that one off and maybe have your department have a little bit more time to talk to other departments, other schools, to see if there's going to be any adjustments and then submit maybe a revised, a proposed stipend schedule for next school year. I don't want to miss anybody. Um, I want everybody to get the proper stipends that they should be getting, but I don't want to be piecemealing this. I'd like to have it presented all at once. And that one for next school year, I don't think that that's a rush to get done tonight. Those are my questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Wait, were those questions? Well, quite kind of. <laughs> statements, <laughs> statements. Okay. Concerns. I Thank you. I just want to also add that when I looked at the personnel schedule, I also had the same uh, thoughts about number 90, 91, and 92 in that I would like to see those adopted as an actual stipend and I, so that I can see our stipend schedule and what we stipend other um, extra jobs at in comparison to this before I can properly um, evaluate if I think that this is appropriate. Um, I would like to see it in the context of our full stipend schedule. Thank you. So Mr. Beckett, I suppose I, I need to ask you, um, based on what's been said so far, do you hear anything that's gonna cause us any issues around retaining staff or bringing in new staff if we move the way the other members? Yeah, uh, thank you, proposed? President Downey. No, no, I don't. I, we, can, we can make these adaptations and bring something back in April. I don't think anything's gonna be impacted by those decisions, so awesome. no problem. Then I would like to make a motion that we accept the HR schedule, removing line item 90, 91, 92, and 94. 
I'll second that. Lisa, we have a motion to second. Patty Cattray. Aye. Anna Marie Noor. Aye. Um, I'm sorry, Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. Whatever my name is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Beckett. What you think? Well, I move to um, what is the new um, it B, which is the February student activity and monthly financial report. Uh, Mr. Harmon. Thank you, President Downey, governing board members. Okay, um, and I'm sorry for pulling it, but again, my question didn't come too late. I was, I was looking over this, and this has been a while since I've looked at this report, but on your last page, it kind of seemed odd to me that Desert Wind had a big fat zero <laughs> in the student activities when every other school had some dollar amount. So I was curious why that was. So every month this just shows our, the history of spending. It changes from month to month. So they, they must have spent all their money. Okay. Seriously? Yeah. They have nothing? Yeah. And I'm sure they're, ex they're expecting some revenues coming in. Mm -hmm. That's how, how these, uh, these accounts Ebb go. And, flow. and if I had my preference, mm -hmm. we'd see all these closer to zero. Some of these have really large balances that kind of rolled year to year. But these, uh, these particular funds are supposed to be this year's money for this year. So. so when you look at some of these funds, so this is just a monthly, or is this a balance of what the this account is, is? These particular are a balance. These are, these are cash funds, so this would be how much cash they have in these accounts. Okay, they must be planning one big trip on some of these schools. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, with that, I would like to motion that we approve um, this item. I'll second. Lisa, we'll have a motion to second. Patty Couture. Aye. Anne Marie Noor. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. And I move to item 8C discussion and possible approval of district benefit plan for school year 2023 to 2024. Mr. Baggett. Thank you, President Downey's and members of the governing board and Dr. Loebman. Um, it's always a joy to be able to bring good news <laughs> in front of you. Uh, we have our benefits plan renewal uh, at this point of time. Uh, I believe, I believe it's fair, fairly self-explanatory. Um, we are not passing any additional cost on to our employees as a result of this 2.5% uh, uh, increase in the rates. Again, we're excited about that. Uh, it has impacted a little bit our employees' dependents because of those rates. Uh, I think we're between kind of about 4%. Uh, so, but again, our commitment has been to our employees and specifically their medical benefit plan. So I'll take any questions you have at this point in time. I don't know. If there's no questions, I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'd just like to make a oh. comment just to <laughs> underline that I think it's actually been five years, six years since um, we pass <laughs> cost on to our employees. Yeah. So this is additional cost that we're, the, the district is taking on board, covering. And I also want to do, but I want, really what I want to say is the other side of the coin, um, you can keep the cost the same, but the benefits go down significantly, significantly higher, co-pays, et cetera. That has also not happened in the last five or six years. Correct. So uh, we've done a lot on mm -hmm. salary and we've done a lot in benefits, in essence, by not making any changes, because it was a good plan in the first place. Right. So thank you and the team. Sorry, thank you. Member Emerson. No, that's fine. I was asking for discussion. So if there's no more discussion, <laughs> I'd like to make, make a motion that we approve the district benefit plan for school year 23-24. A second. Lisa, we have a motion and a second. Patty Couture. Aye. Anna Marie Noor. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. We now move on to item 8D, discussion and possible approval to award RFP 20-109-03 staff and student Luvino devices. Ms. Renor. <laughs> oh, I see Mr. Harmon's over here. Um, this is an, good evening. This is an agenda item to, um, to ask for your approval so that we're able to purchase more computers as we see growth in our district. So it's exciting, and we want to make sure our students and teachers and classified staff are ready for the first day of school. Are I, the per oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Are the purchases being made this fiscal year or for next, fis next fiscal year? They will be purchased this fiscal year. This fiscal year, okay. We for want to get year. them in the hands of to start the school year. Gives the technology time to image and get everything ready. So we, a lot of times with curriculum and even technology, we make the purchases kind of 
in advance. So we're spending about $150,000 this year, but it's for computers next year. And the next year we'll spend you know, about $800,000 for, for computers the, the following year. So. Okay, thank you. So I had asked Dr. Lipman a question about the Lenovo company, and I don't, there may not be an answer yet, but is this the best company that we should go with? Oh, you had asked about the, some sort of security yeah. That a situation. lot of companies are not using the Lenovo computers because yeah. of security issues. Um, I'm not prepared okay. to give you a complete answer on that. I didn't know, I, I apologize that you wanted one tonight I, in public, just, my bad. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, I will get that to you <laughs> ASAP. Just curious. So. If there's no other questions, I'll motion to approve. I'll second. Please, we'll have a motion to second. Patty Gutray. Aye. Anna Marie Knorr. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. We now move on to item 8E, discussion and possible approval of the 2023 to 2024 governing board meeting schedule. Dr. Lopeman. This is a yearly uh, process to set our calendar for next year. And, and there you have it. And I think it's worth commenting that it, it follows a similar profile to this year. I think in previous years, prior to this one, we had almost two meetings every month. This one recognizes some months there's just not a lot of activity and we only have one meeting scheduled. It doesn't mean we can't put other meetings on the schedule as required, but it does reflect, it doesn't reflect, it does reflect that I think it's three months with only one meeting because that's what the board asked for last year. And I'm assuming that the dates um, we took in consideration like the drop dead gate dates for like budget and budget revisions so that we make sure that we have the meeting scheduled. Okay. Yeah, yeah we do and, and even this year, um, we did offer up as a group, as a board, that if Dr. Lopeman or Mr. Beckett or Mr. Harmon needed an additional meeting just to get approval, because there's stuff that we just have to approve yeah. We've through the dais, that. we would organize a yeah. special meeting. We, I don't believe we ever needed one. We had one okay. last one. For last year, I'm talking about for last year. Oh. I'm talking about for last year. Yeah. Um, if there's no discussion, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the governing board calendar meeting schedule for 23-24. I'll second. Lisa, we have a motion to second. Patty Cattray. Aye. Anna Marie Knorr. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. We move on to item 9, 9A, adjourn. So moved. Second. Lisa, we have a motion to second. Patty Cattray. Aye. Anna Marie Knorr. Aye. Tori Anderson. Aye. Robert Downey. Aye. So moved. We are now adjourned.